It's time for a Drummer Nation. Welcome to Drummer Nation, the show for and about drums and drummers. If you make music by hitting something, we welcome you here as a citizen of Drummer Nation. In addition to the show, we have an online community at drummernation.com where you'll find archive shows, other videos, and a forum I encourage you to participate in. Feel free to offer comments and suggestions about the shows and site or anything drum related that's on your mind. Also, be sure to sign up for our spam free newsletter. This is show number two. Up first is Marty Morell, the great jazz drummer who first made a name for himself as a member of what became known as the second great Bill Evans Trio. We'll ask him about playing with the legendary pianist and see what he's up to now. His website is mnmmusicusa.com, where he'll soon be posting some instructional videos on playing with brushes. Anyone who played drums with Bill Evans knows a thing or two about brushes, so I encourage you to check this out at his website. Next up, Scott Von Ravensburg. Scott came up in the L.A. music scene when it was very active and played many tours with Ray Charles before moving to Atlanta, where we became great friends. I caught up with him in his Tampa, Florida home. Last up, an interview with the team behind Classic Drummer Magazine, Steve Bryan and Billy Jensen. In full disclosure, I do some work for them, managing their social media and doing some interviews for video or print. In fact, I earned my first byline with an extensive interview with Peter Erskine in the current edition, which is available online for free. Note that I also post each show segment separately so you can watch or listen a la carte if you wish. Lastly, this show and site are not monetized, so we don't have sponsors per se, but we do have some people to thank. They're listed in the credits, but a special mention is in order for Ed Hamrick, the owner of Atlanta Pro Percussion, for letting us use some of his warehouse space to house our studio. This is Drummer Nation. I'm here today in the Tampa, Florida area, where it's my privilege to talk and hang with the wonderful Marty Morell. Hey man, good to see you, Michael. It's been a while, how you been? Yes, I've been good, excellent. I've been a fan of yours since I was uh, a kid in college. One of the first records I ever heard when I got to, I went to University of North Texas, the first thing they laid on me there from my friends was Montreux 2 with Bill Evans. Oh yes, yes, I remember it well. Which I still right. love. Right. But let's go back before that. Okay. Where are you from? Uh, I was born in New York, raised in New York. And started gigging at an early I age? I started gigging, uh, I think my first gig was uh, I don't know, 13 years old or something like that. And who were your guys mm -hmm. coming up that you were, you were listening to? Uh, well, in the early days, I mean, uh, you know, um, uh, Gene Krupa and then Buddy Rich and, uh, you know, those, those, those cats, like the virtuosos of that, mm -hmm. and that's probably the end of the, that era, you know, in the mm -hmm. 50s, like uh, late 50s. So mid-60s, yeah. you were kind of hitting your stride? Yeah, mid-60s, uh, I had, you know, I was in college, and then I, I met some, some other drummers, and uh, one guy in particular, Alan Schwartzberg, and he and I became good buddies, uh, and he was all about Max Roach and Elvin Jones and, and Philly Joe Jones, and so I was introduced to all of that, you know. Although my last year in high school, the um, bass player introduced me to the Bill Evans Trio, okay, and uh, um, he played me Portrait in Jazz, mm -hmm. and when I heard that, it, that changed my life, because I was absolutely blown away. I said, wow, this is incredible music. Well, that's you know? what I wanted to t discuss. How was that different than the music you of the late 50s? Well, late fifties, you know, I was kind of playing uh, like shows, you know, like uh, in the Catskill Mountains, and, mm -hmm. and uh, um, I was doing uh, gigs, you know. Uh, 
I wasn't doing a lot of jazz, although I did play with Mary McPartland, and I played with Steve Kuhn and Zoot Sims. Oh, yeah. And Al Cohn and Zoot Sims. And, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of a, like a, a swinging style, like straight ahead. Long. And stylistically, by the mid-60s, things had changed. Yeah, it's a, yeah absolutely. And, and how, was, how would you describe those stylistic differences? Well, as you know, um, the early Bill Evans trios Right, were uh, well, the actually the original one, but Scott Lafauer and Paul Motion, um, they created this new rhythm section concept of, of interplay where um, uh, each, each musician had their own voice, uh, melodically and rhythmically, right? They weren't just like chugging along and like, keeping time, right? And that was kind of the beginning of uh, the new modern rhythm section as we know it today. I, I believe that. Anyway, you know. I think so. It's often cited along with John Coltrane Quartet of the day and the Miles Davis mid-60s mm -hmm. Quintet as being the harbinger of what was to come right. with regard to freeing up the limbs and not playing uh, just strictly a supportive role but much more interacting. Right, interacting with one another. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's an interplay. That, that's, uh, mm -hmm. It became more of a conversation within the rhythm section, rather than just like a, a, a functionary machine right. that, that would, would right. you know, support the band. Right. And is that something you were heading towards anyway, or did you make a big adjustment to what you No, I, I didn't make a big adjustment. Um, when I uh, first played with Bill, you know, I had listened to all his records, and uh, you know, I was a huge fan. Mm -hmm. And I admired uh, Paul, Paul Modian. Paul Motion. Back then, we used to say Paul Motion or Paul Modian. I'm, I'm not sure which is correct, I'm, I'm right? Not. But but uh, I, I, you know, I just love that trio, and uh, uh, so uh, the natural thing to do was what you know when I had a chance to play with Bill was to try to emulate Paul Motion, right? So um, that's what I did, and and we tried to just kind of fall into that. That was a natural way to play with Bill. I I thought it, it felt. That was what felt the best. Best way. Well, it was a classic trio, yeah. rounded out by Eddie Gomez, who who was doing similar things on the bass. Right. right? It was all three right. roles were different. Right. We, we, we were just kind of taking, you know, what what Scott Lafauer started and Scott Lafauer and uh, Paul Motion, what they started. We, you know, stayed in that vein and tried to, you know, uh, imitate that and take from that and then just take it a few steps further. Yes, you did. And in that day, though, I imagine this is not something that was discussed on the bandstand. No. No, never. Um, you know, it was uh, something that was a kind of, uh, you know, you just either you could play that way or, or not, you know. And um, uh, I was fortunate enough to have listened to Bill a lot before and I kind of understood what was required. Mm -hmm. So when I got the opportunity to play with him, I kind of fell in. In fact, the first night at the Vanguard, um, he told me, uh, I said, wow, he said, it sounds like you've been playing with us for a long time. And I said, well, in a way I have, and I've been listening so much. That I knew all the material and then the style, and you know, so. Of course, I was nervous, but uh, uh, somehow, you know, Bill made me feel very comfortable. He was just a sweet person, you know, it was nothing, you know, uh, you, you couldn't relax with Bill and you had a problem, you know, like Bill mm -hmm. just was, he was just so open and so friendly and, and so kind that that, uh, it, that put me at ease. You know? As opposed to some band leaders that are very tense. Yes, right. Um, so what years were you with that trio? Well, um, 68 to 74. So any of the kids today who aren't familiar with the Bill Evans trio, the first one, the first grade trio you mentioned, the second grade trio which you were in, or even had another one later in life, need to check out Bill Evans and Mike yeah. Morell. Right. Well. <laughs>
Now, a- after the Bill Evans gig, you, you moved to Canada? Well, I, I uh, settled down in Canada. I was on the road uh, for um, uh, quite some time before that, and my, my ex-wife was uh, Canadian. And um, we had uh, some friends in Toronto, and it was a nice music scene. And um, um, I thought, you know what, let's, I really love this town. Let's, let's come and stay here for maybe about a year. And I wound up staying for almost 25 years. In Toronto? In Toronto, yeah. And, and I started what, working a lot. And what kind of work were you doing there? Well, uh, at first, uh, I worked at a jazz club called uh, Bourbon Street, and uh, we, the house rhythm section. And we played for people like Milt Jackson, um, Arnold Kessel, Herb Ellis, uh, Zoot Sims came through, Al Cohen came through, uh, Art Pepper came through, Who's Tom, Tom Harrell. Um, yeah, it was it was you know it was a great gig you know yeah. and uh, um, you know so you can't beat it. You always had a good rhythm section. So in fact, I recently discovered a, a recording that I did. With, like, that's why you see my old four track machine there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Tom Harrell uh, was uh, the guest artist that week. Great trumpet player. Great trumpet trumpet player, absolutely. He's he's amazing. And uh, I think he was about 25 years old. And I'm talking, this was 1978 to 79, something like that. And um, I hadn't heard of him before. And it was a great rhythm section. Bernie Sininsky on piano, great Canadian piano player. And a bass player named Rick Hummey. Unfortunately, Rick passed away a few years ago, but uh, he was a great bass player. And uh, uh, at rehearsal, we all turned to each other and said, what is this? This guy is amazing. So, I, you know, the next night I brought down my tape recorder and, and recorded, you know. And I finally was able to, after all these years, I was looking at those tapes saying, man, i got to do something with these mm-hmm. tapes, you know. Because I remember it being a fantastic week, and uh, uh, I hadn't... I listened, I had listened to them once since then in all those years. And I thought, one of these days I have to transfer them to some other, you know, to digital source, right? Yeah. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, I finally got around to do that. And, and, and uh, uh, it was really great to listen to that, that stuff. I mean, I was, uh, I was 35 years old or something, you know. And it holds up, right? It, well, it, it's, yeah, it's got the kind of different kind of energy happening that, you know, but uh, uh, the playing is super. In fact, I'm thinking about, I'm trying to, going to try to get it released. Yeah. But I think the quality is not too bad. Yeah. yeah. And you were also doing some session work? Yeah, I did, I did a lot of session work. That was primarily, once I started doing the studio work, um, that kind of snowballed. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, um, now that's know, a different set of demands altogether, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So you had to make adjustments. Well, I had to make adjustments and, you know, play different styles of music. And before I was with Bill, I played a lot of shows and, and stuff like that. And uh, kind of always try to understand different styles of music. Mm-hmm. And it, you grow up in New York, it's like, it's all about survival. Mm-hmm. You know, so you just want to be able to work here or there, with the, you know, any place you could earn a buck, you know. So um, uh, once I started doing studio work, um, yeah, I learned there was a different kind of tuning on the drums and different styles, a lot of pop and that, you know, that kind of thing. And then I only did a lot of variety TV shows. It was a mixture of big band stuff or country music or, mm-hmm. or some harder rock style or pop or Latin. What stuff. was the key to being able to cross all those bridges and play them authentically? Just listening? Just listening. And, you know, just kind of having a feel for it, you know, uh, mm-hmm. as musicians, you know, we're always listening to all kinds of music. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, as a drummer, you listen to what the drums are doing, right? So, you know, when you get a, an opportunity to play that, of course, there's charts for everything, you know. And, uh, but most drum parts are, are just written in a kind of a sketch form right. where you have to interpret and, and, and play your own thing in that context. A lot of people yeah. don't realize drum set parts, people who don't know, so how can you read all those things at once? Well, you're not really. It's a guide. And then you have to, which is equally hard, or harder, is to improvise. To create the particular feel that's required for that. Yeah. that and the part, that, and catch all yeah. the styles, and, yeah. and catch all the mm-hmm. fills and hits, and, right. and whatever the band plays. Absolutely. And the, the more I did that, the better I got at it. You know, mm-hmm. I started you know, working almost every day, you know. Uh, but along with that, I did a lot of percussion uh, work as well. I, was, I studied mallets at, at Manhattan School of Music and at Juilliard. So, mm-hmm. you know, once the word got around that I, I, I played percussion, I got hired to play studio dates on percussion. So I play when you say percussion, and, you mean mostly mallets? Or, mallets, or, or, uh, congas, timpani, uh, the whole thing. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. 
And you're a piano player too, right? Well, I wouldn't call myself. You wouldn't call yourself a piano piano player, player, but but you play piano. That was my first instrument. But uh, I've always loved um, playing the piano. I've always uh, been uh, uh, trying to learn about harmony, and and Mm -hmm. I started working with Bill. I love the sounds he gets out of the instrument. And I've always explored and practiced and tried to find, you know, some of those sounds, you know, and and uh, learn tunes and and uh, you I know, would, and it's a it's a beautiful thing. I would imagine anyone who worked with Bill would, if they had any uh, affinity for the piano, would gravitate towards that in a similar way that uh, many musicians who worked with Elvin would end up playing a little drums. Yeah, yeah. That, that's some of that's got to get in yourself. Yeah, well, I, I think. You know, uh, all musicians uh, should play some piano. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. I, I think it's a, it's a good thing for everybody: horn players, mm-hmm. drummers, um, uh, and anybody who plays music should understand, you know, something about the way uh, uh, chords work and and uh, structure. You know, and uh, should play a little bit of piano at UCF, where I teach. And I'm coming into my tenth year. Starting that's University of Central Florida. Uh, in Orlando? At, yes, in Orlando. It's East Orlando. Um, S- September is going to be the beginning of my 10th year. And, yeah, I can't believe it. it's been that, you know, that long. But, uh, but it's a beautiful thing. And, and all our students, our, the drum students, are required to play piano. I work on them with their ear training. And uh, for the jury exams, they have to know certain tunes. They have to know uh, at least to play with third, thirds and sevenths and the melody. Mm-hmm. And they have to know how to play it in at least three keys. Uh, so we emphasize that uh, at, in our program. I, I think it's really a good thing. Uh, yeah, I would agree. Drummers, drummers should learn that, should understand how that works. Well, picking up where you, you left Toronto, eventually you landed on Broadway, right? Yes, yes. Tell uh, us about that. Well, I, I started the, you know, the Broadway thing um, up in Canada because uh, uh, I found that I was working in a jazz club, uh, and then I'd get home at 2, 3 in the morning, then I'd have to get up for an early session. Mm-hmm. Right. So um, I, I was called to do a, a chorus line, and that was one of my first shows in Toronto, right? So uh, I started doing the theater thing, and I really enjoyed it. And it was great, and I could be home by 11 o'clock, and, and the money was better. And what I like about it. theater gigs is when you play the bows, you turn off the stand light, and you stand up and go home. You stand up and go home. You don't have and to it's pack out. Yeah, you don't have to pack out. You can go out and hear some music right. somewhere, you know? So um, uh, I started to gravitate, you know, with a family, I started to gravitate towards, um, you know, those kind of gigs, you know. So, um, uh, and uh, the late, uh, let's see, late 80s, uh, I started doing a Phantom of the Opera. So I did Phantom of the Opera in, in Canada. And the uh, producer, uh, Garth Drabinsky, right, he, uh, he uh, created Ragtime. The show Ragtime, it was mm-hmm. on Broadway. And we premiered it in Canada, in Toronto. I think it was 1997, 98, something like that. And uh, it was coming to Broadway, and they asked me if I would do Broadway. And I thought, you know, I never played Broadway. So I thought, yeah, I would do that. So while I'm coming to, to Broadway. Back and, home uh, to New York. Back home to New York, that's right. And then uh, moved lock, stock, and barrel, stole my house, sold my house, and mm-hmm. packed up. And How long was that run? Well, it, it ran for two years on Broadway. And uh, um, then I, I picked up a few other shows. I did uh, Kiss Me but, Kate. But, but hey, I want to ask you about that. Sure. As a jazz drummer, where, you know, Dizzy Gillespie, was it Dizzy famously said, uh, we never play anything the same way once? <laughs> right. Uh, in, right. Uh, if you yeah. do a Broadway sit-down for two years... That's a different mindset altogether it's than improvising mindset. every night. It's a different mindset, absolutely. But it's again, it's it's about survival. You know, we, we if you have the ability to do it and it's there, then why not? You know, I mean, it's it, it, I, you take care of my family and you know, mortgage and stuff like that. Well, it's not a criticism, but yeah, anyway. yeah. So uh, so uh, it's 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 just it's just a, it's just an, an attitude. You just have to change your attitude and and approach it that way. You know, uh, mm-hmm. and that's that's uh, I'm thankful. Like you know that that that's it. Uh, all that was there, and then I could, I could uh, have had the opportunity to be able to to do that. You know, it, it was it was great. It was uh, a lot of fun, and uh, I always always learned a lot. And uh, it was great to be able to earn a living doing what you love to do. You know.
My next guest is a buddy of mine, Scott Von Ravensburg. Thanks for doing this, Scott. Michael, good to see you again. Same here. Uh, you're originally from Los Angeles, right? Los Angeles. I grew up in La Mirada. And you came up with an, a real happening scene when you were a kid. You were playing with some pretty cool ensembles. Tell yeah. me about that. High school was, uh, I had a band director that respected big band music and was very much into the, the whole swing thing from the bebop era through the big band era. And uh, it was it was really an exciting time because L.A. was hot and busy back then. It was the 19, late 60s. And there were a lot of things going on. So having a band director that appreciated that, the band would go to competitions and uh, win competitions around California. So it was it was good. It was an exciting time to have been part of the music business. And weren't you part of that Kenton Neophonic Junior Orchestra or something like that? I was. I started working with that band when I was a senior in high school in my first year of college at Cerritos College. Uh, Stan Kenton had the Junior Neophonic. It was an opportunity for people to play in an orchestral kind of setting uh, with a big band, and it was amazing music. I had an opportunity to work with some great people. Uh, Oliver Ooh. Nelson was one of the one of the conductors that conducted the band. Plus, the musicians in the band were great. There were a lot of good players there that wound up doing a lot of uh, a lot of recording and TV stuff in the Los Angeles area. Great training too. Absolutely, it? yeah. It was. You had to be able to read. You had to be able to play concepts of music. L.A. was all about knowing different styles of music. So it was a, it was a good proving ground to start in that young age and work up until now. It's always it's been a benefit to have been around folks. I was in high school hanging around with guys that had been on Buddy's band or Woody's band and Stan Kenton's band, and it was a lot of information was being passed back and forth with all of those fellows. Uh, so well, you must, always learned how, how to take care of business. Must have held you in good stead with those different styles and taking care of business when you worked with Ray Charles. Oh yeah, Ray was <laughs> Ray was the ultimate playing styles. Ray was, was really one of the most ideal gigs ever because it was big band music, it was blues music, it was uh, country music. It was everything that you could imagine playing in the style that, that it was meant to be. That's how Ray did everything. So there was a, a lot of different type of genres that were handled just playing a Ray's band alone. Now Ray had his own way of leading a band, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, he was a little hard on the drummers. Uh, he would use his feet for the drummers to see the time, and he would use his head to conduct the orchestra. When you see him moving his head like this, he was actually conducting the music like this with his head. Of course, when I was there, there was no mercy at all when I first started the first gigs. The first gig I worked was in Fenway Park in Boston. And it was outside, it was nighttime, and I was probably about 45 or 50 feet from Ray. And having no clue what I was looking at when I first joined the band and got on the bandstand with him, outside in that type of context, it was uh, it was pretty crazy. Trial by fire. A trial by fire. And uh, you worked with him on several stints. When, when did you work with him? I worked with him in 73, 75, 76, and a little bit in 77, and I went back out again in 1985. That was the last time I'd worked with him. He must have liked you. He, he did. We, uh, once we got to know each other, it was, it was pretty easy to play with him. He's, he's been known to be hard on musicians, and he was always hardest on drummers because drummers tend to be in charge of the band. They tend to want to play the time. You can't do that with Ray. You have to listen to where the time sits with Ray. That being said, Ray was a wonderful leader in terms of playing the music. He knew what he wanted to hear. It was that way as consistent as a clock, as a human clock. So it was easy once you got to know him that that's where it was going to be. And if he decided to change the tempos, he would let you know where it was. And that way it was uh, fairly simple. Tell me how you knew when you lost an argument with Ray. <laughs> that it was, when, it, when that was it. Uh, Ray used to have a thing where he would cross his arms. He, he talked to you like this. And when he was done with the conversation, he would do this. And that was the end of the story. And I was watching the movie Ray, and I couldn't believe how Jamie Foxx actually understood that that's how it worked. He understood the mannerisms. He understood every nuance of what Ray did. So I'm watching the movie with my wife, and they're having the conversation about Atlantic, well, to the president of Atlantic Records. And the guy says, Ray, we, we can't let you have your 
your masters and Ray did that and I just started howling my wife said quiet quiet what are you doing I said you don't understand this guy Jamie Foxx has has made it perfect of how Ray was now during that period uh, I guess after the when you were a kid with the Kenton Neophonic Junior Orchestra and before going out on the road in earnest you were doing a lot of studio work in LA right I was doing some studio work, not a lot. I did a lot of live gigs. I did a backing of shows and things. I worked at a lot of the theaters there. And I was able to work with a, a number of artists out there, which was because I had learned how to read in high school. And it was important to learn how to do that and then learn how to play the styles of music. I had an opportunity, plus growing up with guys that were all on road bands, coming to Los Angeles to do the recording. I had an opportunity to uh, work with a lot of good people that would always pass work on in Los Angeles back then, this was the late 60s, early 70s, everybody was busy. There was a lot of things going on. So I had the good fortune to work for A&M, CBS, and NBC. I did some stuff re recording with Ray for a Scotch brand recording tape, and uh, there were a lot of jingles that I played on, and there were a lot of different things. So there were shows. They were club dates. In fact, they were uh, they were casuals in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. uh, the club dates, I didn't learn that name until I moved to Atlanta. What's an East Coast term? It, it is. In LA, they're casual. And they were casuals, right? You worked with some singers, too? I worked with uh, Olivia Newton-John. I went to college with Bobby McFerrin. So there was some real interesting folks that I got to work with. I mean, it was a lot of people. A lot of people. Uh, was, I know you worked with Robert Goulet. I worked with Robert Goulet for a couple of years back in the 80s, and that was another big band gig. I just, I loved playing big band music, and that's what I cut my eye teeth on. The reason I got the Ray Charles gig was from a friend of mine who grew up in Whittier, John Hernandez. All of you folks know John Hernandez as Johnny Vatos. He also told me about the Zappa gig, and the Zappa gig, that scared the hell out of me. I couldn't play that stuff to save my behind. Not to mention reading it. Oh, God, there was no way I could do any of that. I was just <laughs> a, a big band drummer that loved playing music, so I had to learn as much as I could. But there was another kid out there named David Krieger, who was just a wonderful player, a young guy. When I was coming up, he was, he was just coming up. He had studied with Ralph. He went out on the road with Don Ellis' band, and he went out and did the, the Zappa gig as well. That there were just guys, I was fortunate enough to grow up at a time in Los Angeles when there were people doing a lot of things. And the energy was there. The camaraderie was there. The friendship mm -hmm. was there. Everybody was working, can you do this? Can you do that? Can you work this? Can, and you go to rehearsal bands. Rehearsal bands we don't hear of much. I since did one I of those. It was Atlanta. a Kenton book. You know, like <laughs> yeah. a rehearsal band. Yeah. For people who don't know, maybe you young guys, yeah, a rehearsal band is guys who get, and girls, get together and play charts and have fun for no apparent reason other than... Well, the reason we was, it. when you get to the studios, you can't make mistakes. So the rehearsal bands would keep your eyes sharp and keep your reading skills together so that you knew what you were going to do so you could do in one take. And there was a lot of orchestras in L.A. that could do stuff in one take. Um, now, we can't let you go without talking about Freddie Gruber. Freddie, he was quite, quite the character. The legendary drum teacher, Freddie Gruber, that, that you hear all kinds of wonderful drummers talking about was a unique individual with his own unique style. Is that correct? That's correct, very correct. <laughs> I, uh, when I was in high school, I won some uh, jazz festival. Louis Belson was one of the adjudicators, and I talked with Louis after the concert, and uh, I asked him if he could be my teacher. I wanted to study with Louis, and he referred me to Hank Belson. Hank Belson is his brother, Henry. Uh, Henry used to teach at a place called The Music Stop. And so I started studying with Henry, and I went to a place in Sherman Oaks, The Music Stop, and I'm in the room, and I hear, we're sitting there. Henry was a, a uh, Jehovah's Witness, very kind, very, very quiet, very peaceful guy. And we're in the stu the studio, the the, uh, the drum studio, and from next door we hear this foul sailor language. Just the guy next door is hollering at the guy he was studying with. They, they, you got to play it like this and MF this, and you got to do. Well, that was my first introduction to Freddie Gruber. Hank looked at me, and I looked at him. I'm in high school, and I'm going, what? What is this? I have no idea. And Hank goes, Freddie. <laughs> well, as it turns out, most of the guys in L.A., and it's, after a while, most of the guys around the world were coming to Freddie because he knew the mechanics of playing drums. So a few years later, I went and, and sought Freddie out and learned how to play uh, 
correctly, if you will, how to hold the stick, how to rebound the stick, how to approach the drum set. And it was Freddie that did that, but Freddie was an adventure unto himself. He was <laughs> quite a guy. Well, how long were the lessons? The lessons could be like two or three hours, but the lesson wouldn't be you sitting there for two or three hours. It would be him making meatloaf or going for coffee at his, at making coffee and hanging out with the guy that was there before you. And uh, it, like I say, it was an adventure unto itself, but it was worth it because the things that he taught me benefited me throughout all of the styles of music I played through my entire life in the 55 years I've been playing. Now you and I ran into each other. We didn't know each other in L.A., but in Atlanta we met. Right, exactly. And you had been doing all the house stuff for the Ritz-Carlton Corporation headquarters there. Right. And uh, had had enough of that and handed it off to me. Right. I had been working with uh, the music director there uh, for a couple of years. And I, the first job that I had there was with a wonderful piano player named Ted Howe and a bass player named Rich Nanista. And it was just wonderful. So I did that for a couple of years, and then it was time to move on because I had just moved there. Uh, and Michael came along, and he filled the they filled the shoes and did a great job. Well, I appreciated the gig. We've done a lot of sharing of gigs through the years. Nice to be able to sit back and go, yeah, I did that. You live to tell about it. I did. <laughs> Thanks for everything, man. All right. Thank you, Michael. It's good You're to welcome. see you. Same here. Hi, right, for this segment, it's my pleasure to be at the headquarters for Classic Drummer Magazine with founder of the magazine, Billy Jensen. Hey, nice to be here, Michael. Thank you for doing this. And publisher, Steve Bryant. Good to see you, Michael. How are you guys? Great. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go back to the beginning, Billy. You founded the magazine. When was that? That was uh, January of 2001. And uh, I was into uh, collecting vintage drums pretty heavily back then. And uh, I actually just started the magazine out as a newsletter, and it just morphed into a magazine, first called Vintage Drummer, and then in 2005, we did a name change to a classic drummer. Mm -hmm. And how long have you been involved, Steve? I got involved with, involved with Billy around 2010. Uh, I was a fan of the magazine, and I met Billy, mm -hmm. and... Uh, we knew pretty clearly, as most magazines know, that print is not the future. And so, uh, as an owner of a media company, we were excited about the opportunity of taking Classic Drummer and being involved in its transformation into a multimedia publication, a publication that could be serving our readers for, de for you know, a long time to come, as opposed to the, uh, the print model that is, uh, is slowly uh, disappearing for all magazines. Mm -hmm. We'll touch more on that in a second. The original focus of the magazine was what? A newsletter for uh, collectors, for drum collectors, but uh, I was friends with, uh, and still am, uh, friends with John Aldrich who had, who founded Not So Modern Drummer. So I kind of used his magazine as a gauge uh, to turn the newsletter into a, a, a collectible, a collector's uh, drum magazine, but I uh, uh, immediately knew he was covering the bases as far as the, the gear uh, went, uh, you know, the nuts and bolts of the drum collecting uh, people, and it's like, well, I want to go more towards the area of the artist, mm -hmm. and so that's why I focused on uh, interviews with the, uh, basically, the, the drummers of the past, uh, which were vintage drummers, and I didn't like really calling them vintage drummers, mm -hmm. so that that's how the name changed. That's how we went into a classic drummer. And then I remember I asked you, Steve, who are the subjects for the magazine? And you said important drummers. Well, for classic drummer, important drummers are drummers who make important music, uh, music that had an impact on the culture. Uh, it is not fair that a lot of fine, fine players don't ever get to make music that has an impact. It's also serendipity that some really adequate players have the opportunity to make some very impactful music. Um, and so we're driven by the music. And when someone says, uh, you gotta see this drummer, you, you guys need to talk to him. My first question is, uh, what did he play? What's his music? Uh, and then, you know, based on the uh, impact of the music, the importance of the music, uh, it determines uh, the desirability 
of that uh, artist for our viewers. And we respect all drummers. We, we wish we could play as well as any of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and we are uh, envious of their, of their talents and, and enjoy their talents. But uh, we want to archive and preserve the stories of the drummers who made uh, the important music of our time. And the thing about the using music as a, as a guideline is it keeps the magazine evergreen. Uh, Dave Brohl was just inducted into the Classic Drummer Hall of Fame. A uh, relatively young guy, but he made very impactful music uh, and, um, and, and plays drums with his hands and his feet. And that's a, that's a, a very important piece. Uh, we saw, I saw an article in a magazine uh, that was from a very talented young man who took pride in the fact that he had touched with his computer every drum beat in the song. Hmm. Well, that's not classic drumming. Right. Uh, it's important drumming, it's pop drumming, it's mm -hmm. drumming that matters to, to a certain audience. Uh, we lean toward the folks who play the instrument, play it you know, in, in a way that, that is less involved with technology and more involved with heart. Well, I like the fact that you're looking at an important drummer as someone who has made important music, instead of just focusing on the virtuoso aspect of the star drummers. And, and you know, thankfully they're there. But there's another world of wonderful drummers out there that are benefiting from the exposure. Now, you also talked about print going away. You, what's, what are your options now? You've redesigned that delivery model, haven't you? Yeah, we, listen, we all love print. Um, there's an aesthetic of print that's very pleasing. I we all love album covers. Nothing better than holding up a 12-inch album cover. Um, so nice to have a nice print magazine. We pr and we produce the highest quality print magazine that can be produced. And it's not cheap to do and not cheap to buy, but it's very nice. And for the collectors who have been collecting the magazine for 15 plus years, mm -hmm. um, it's an important piece and we have a, a, an audience for that. The thing about a print magazine is if you're in the airport and you missed your flight, you probably aren't going to have your magazine with you, but you're going to have your smartphone, you're going to have your tablet, and with our apps and with our various ways to access the magazine, you always have Classic Drummer. Mm -hmm. The other problem with print is it doesn't sound that good. <laughs> so if you have a print magazine, this magazine is a lovely magazine with, with Steve Gadd, and we could listen to it as long as we'd like. But we're not going to hear anything. Not going to hear anything. If you listen to this, you get to hear Steve tell his story. You get to hear Steve give a lesson. You get to hear Steve describe how he came up with some of his seminal uh, drum beats. And that's something that a, ma that a paper magazine just can't deliver. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that if you're, if you're in the business of music and sound, that you would want to mm -hmm. use the medium that provides the reader the, mo the best access to that. And that's why while paper will always be part, an archival part of our history and available to those collectors who like to collect them, uh, the future is going to, be, are going to be media where we can really give the reader a more complete experience. Excellent. Uh, what a great idea. And uh, Billy, you've been going to, I know, the Chicago Vintage Show for many years, the Chicago Drum Show as it's called now. Right. We have, uh, Classic Drummer now has a new affiliation with, with Rob, Cook and Chicago Drum Show mm -hmm. through the Hall of Fame. Right. Is that right? Yeah, Classic Drummer Hall of Fame is uh, supporting, which uh, Steve said, you know, uh, got involved with Rob Cook on that, so he knows more about it. But yeah, Classic Drummer Hall of Fame uh, is one of the supporters, if not the main supporter of the show. Talk about the Hall of Fame. Well, the Hall of Fame was, was, was put in place uh, so that... Um, there would be a central place for researchers and, um, and folks who are learning the instrument and f to access the, the important drummers. Now, the important drummers based on the opinions of our readers. So every year our readers vote, we get thousands of votes for the Hall of Fame, and then the, the, um, the uh, top vote getters are inducted into the Hall of Fame. They're sent an award. Um, we communicate with them. They often share media assets with us. Often they're kind enough to, to uh, 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 
do interviews with us in subsequent mm -hmm. magazines. But the Classic Drum Hall of Fame now includes probably some 50 drummers. And there are drummers that um, are very important drummers uh, musically that won't show up in a jazz poll. They might not show up in the uh, Rolling Stone poll, but the music they made outsold, out-impacted uh, the music of maybe a third of the people in the top 100 drummers in the, in the Rolling Stone poll. Uh, again, because it is about the music. So we put that in place, and it's an important part of, of what we do. It, uh, we think it's important to the, to the artist uh, because it uh, accurately begins to chronicle their career in a brief way that we add to over time. Uh, we took that piece that we think was an important service to the readers, an important service to the music, and we met Rob Cook, who I feel um, provides an important service to uh, the in industry as well. Uh, he really honors the instrument in a way that's, that's very special, and he also honors education in a way that's very special. And he's been doing that for about 25 years, this is his 26th show. So we got together and, and uh, we were able to bring Rob's uh, media assets uh, into, uh, uh, we work with him closely to continue to accelerate his media assets. Uh, he, he always has had a, a strong video presence if you've been to any of his shows. And uh, we were really excited to cooperate with him and really because we just love the show. Uh, we love the show, uh, Rob loves the magazine. And we both of us do what we do for that reason. We so nice to dovetail. It was there. superb. We're very mm -hmm. excited and we can't wait for the show. Excellent. Well, uh, for our viewers and listeners, where would we go? Is it What's the website, Billy? Uh, classicdrummer.com, as far as the, the magazine goes. Right. And, and then there's an offshoot for the... There's the, hall, the Classic Drummer Hall of Fame.com, Classic Drummer Hall of Fame, and then uh, the Chicago... Uh, drumshow.com uh, is where you can get the information. Any of our any of our sites, of course, will also lead you to the Chicago Drum Show site. The Chicago Drum Show site will lead you back to the Hall of Fame because the Hall of Fame is actually the sponsor of the show. Okay, so uh, people can read and learn about all manner of things involved with Classic Drummer from those websites, and they also have the option to order a very high gloss, high heavy duty uh, collectible. Hard copy magazine. Exactly. Great. Well, best of luck with the magazine. We'll be looking for what you've got next. Great. I look forward to seeing you at the show. Thanks, guys. Hey, thank you.